Today we're lucky to have Ali Hashmi speak to us. Ali, uh, other than being a friend, is also a researcher at the Center for Civic Media. Uh, he's particularly interested in three things and in the intersection of them, so language, uh, social identity, and power, and specifically the inequities of that power, and especially in the journalism space, how that plays out. And that's what he's going to talk to us about today. So Thank give you. Give a warm Thank welcome to Ali. Thank you, Sans, for the kind, in, uh, kind introduction. And uh, because I think uh, the audience is quite diverse, uh, I'm going uh, and the the my presentation actually touches upon disparate subjects like machine learning, critical theory, and journalism. I'm going to leave more technical questions um, for the Q and A session, if that's okay with all, all of you. So, the title of uh, my uh, presentation today is uh, Ideology and Text, Classifying and Analyzing Discourse Using Machine Learning. Um, so discourse is actually, um, what is discourse? Discourse is used um, in a broad sense in a variety of different contexts, but the way I'm using discourse is actually in Foucauldian sense. So Foucault sees discourse as a set of announcements or statements which regulate, define, disciplines, and objects and practices for a given uh, epistemic space. So in other words, discourse is not produced in power vacuum. It actually uh, perpetuates power relations. Uh, it drives uh, policy. And it accounts for a wider set uh, of uh, attitudes and behaviors. Um, so mo the more important thing is that the discourse constructs objects that we use to understand uh, and define our world. So I'll show you this. Uh, this clipping from 1907 uh, from Daily Oklahoman. Um, this is from the Jim Crow days. And what you see here is essentially um, a cartoon and text that reflects the wider beliefs in the society of that time. So the text, just like the cartoon, is a representation that defines the object that it is speaking about. So the, the idea of representation is really important uh, in uh, the Foucauldian idea of discourse. Now, I'll use this example um, from, um, so in our world, basically. So how would we actually um, understand it in our context? So I'm using this uh, Marilyn Diptych, which is actually um, by Warhol, as an analog for the discourse in our world. So as you see in the diptych, actually, the actual image barely exists. You don't have the actual image. What we have is actually a series of regressions from the original image. So. Using so there's and what happens is basically it is the actual whole which constitute the original image as a whole. So there is an absence of the original image, but because of these series of regressions, we are able to picture the image through that. So text pretty much operates like that in our world of pervasive computing. So it is not important um, whether uh, something is true or not. What is important is um, how uh, the, the narrative that it generates and also. Once you say something often enough, actually, uh, once you repeat it, actually, uh, it becomes uh, uh, true, uh, truth, uh, uh, truth, basically. So this is the truth effect. So I'll just uh, uh, go through some examples of like uh, um, how discourse uh, operates. So here are some um, aspects of example. We all know how African Amer Americans uh, are linked uh, when it comes to, for example, crime is more strongly linked with the social identity of African Americans rather than socioeconomic factors. And um, this becomes the organizing principle for our society uh, on the, and for effects like segregation, policy bias, and racial stereotyping. But um, if you look on the, uh, the, the next picture, basically, it shows you how single mothers are talked about in, uh, in media. And then you have uh, another headline which says, BBC put Muslims before you, which contextualizes Muslims as the other. So these are some examples. But the next one is quite pernicious one, and uh, the classical case of Iraq, where you see uh, Powell's speech in the uh, UN, uh, in, in UN actually spawning a discourse that drove a war for uh, a narrative for war in global media sources. And uh, then um, the Rothram scandal that happened in UK, where onus of few individuals were actually was actually transferred to the entire community, and you can see it, the terms that are being used over there, for example from Muslim communities, uh, several sex attackers from Muslim communities. So the entire community becomes responsible uh, as a result of this particular discourse. These are some examples of how discourse operates in our world. 
Now, um, there is actually uh, critical discourse analysis is actually a field that builds upon the work of Foucault and Gramsci. And what it does is basically, it, it, its aim is to understand the link between the social and the text. So it, it, it attempts to demystify power and social construction um, uh, by understanding the linkages between the ideology and the text. And it is very much a hypothesis-based uh, or hypothesis-driven approach because you're really trying to establish the link between the ideology and the text. However, uh, there are some issues with critical discourse analysis. So uh, one critique uh, is that you know, the researchers who are using this particular technique, uh, they cherry pick small amounts of data to um, support their preconceived ideologies. And then the other thing is, of course, do, uh, has to do with um, you know, the, that, that a single text itself is quite insignificant. And considering the fact because, uh, that there is rapid explosion of text all around us, there are 571 new websites that are created every minute. This is a statistic from uh, 2014. Um, it is difficult for us to actually make sense of what the discourse is without taking into account large amounts of data. So um, how do we actually resolve this? So there is actually another field, which is corpus linguistics. So corpus linguistic, linguistics is actually an agnostic way of uh, understanding how language is produced in large amounts of data. So unlike uh, critical discourse analysis, we are just, we're, we're, we're trying to establish, okay, what is the relationship between ideology and uh, text? Corpus linguistics is uh, focused on, okay, what, how, is, how is the language pro is produced? What are the patterns that are out there? We don't go in with a hypothesis in, the, in this particular approach. So what I've done is essentially, as part of my framework, um, I have actually um, aimed to combine critical discourse analysis with corpus linguistics in an, uh, using an analytical framework that will allow us to um, inform us on defining features, metrics, and design requirements uh, for a tool that will machine classify and analyze discourse. So if you see on the right side, you have the critical discourse analysis, which is establishing the link between the ideology and the text. And then you have corpus linguistics, which is an agnostic way of looking at uh, the text. At the conjunction, you have the corpus-assisted uh, critical discourse analysis. So this is the framework that I'm actually working with. So as an instance of this particular uh, framework, what I um, uh, did was I actually um, looked at the coverage of Islam in the global mainstream media. So my work was actually informed by two key thinkers. One is Edward Said, and the other is Samuel P. Huntington. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Edward C. Said actually um, sees the coverage of Islam as uh, marked by highly exaggerated stereotyping and belligerent hostility. And uh, on the other hand, we have Samuel P. Huntington, who sees the conflict between the so-called West and the so-called East in civilizational terms. Uh, so the Huntington, uh, I, the Huntington trope actually has contributed significantly to the development and deepening of false lines between Muslim cultures in Middle East and uh, European and North American societies. So that, that is a very dangerous uh, uh, theme. And I think this is the same theme that is actually picked up by uh, extremist organizations like ISIS. They work within the same framework. So I think that is, that is, why, that is why it is very important for us to understand uh, the, the discourse that is generated as a result of uh, Huntington's um, philosophy. So um, as part of the hypothesis, I looked at four different hypotheses. Uh, the first one was, um, uh, quite obvious that 9/11 has, of course, influenced the uh, framing of discourse on Islam in uh, the in the U.S. and, of course, in the uh, uh, in the world at large. And the second one is that uh, the mainstream media, uh, when uh, it largely portray, portrays Muslims as a group, as a homogeneous group embroiled in conflict, uh, either as aggressors or as victims, but largely as the former. This is the second one that I have, and the third one I have is that. Muslims are portrayed as the other, using the binary lens of the us and them, and framed within the Huntington's clash of civilization frame. And the fourth one is that Muslims are connected more strongly with terrorism than other uh, religious groups. So um, I, in order to implement uh, 
the tool, I focused on the second hypothesis, which is essentially um, that media discourse portrays Muslims as a homogeneous population embroiled in conflict. The reason why I picked up this one was because I thought that particular hypothesis sort of conflates the four hypotheses into one. So again, to recap here, we have this hypothesis that we're working on, we and then um, we use uh, critical discourse analysis and corpus linguistics to actually come up with uh, an analyzer and classifier tool. Now, before we go into the actual implementation, um, let's discuss what I mean by conflict, because conflict is a very broad term. Um, so for, for, the, for the sake of implementation, I define conflict as something that, that is characterized by uh, extremism or force or militancy. So um, if there is, for example, uh, an ongoing struggle between two groups, which is uh, non-militant, I don't actually characterize it as, a con uh, as conflict in my definition. So this is uh, something that we have to keep in mind. This is, was the basis for developing, developing this particular tool. Um, I think most of you are familiar with Media Cloud. So my tool is actually built on top of Media Cloud. And uh, for those of you who, uh, who are not aware, um, who do not know what Media Cloud is, it is actually um, uh, a joint uh, venture of uh, Center for Civic Media and Berkman Center. And as part of the project, we are curating more than 50,000 uh, sources. Um, uh, on a daily basis, and um, for the last nine to nine or ten years, and what that that allows us is basically open source access to these uh, cor corpora, uh, media corpora, to build tools upon. So I'm using Media Cloud to actually uh, extract articles about Islam by using the Media Cloud uh, query builder. So, for example, how do I, how would I build the query um, to extract articles pertaining to Islam. So I will actually look for terms that you know, are usually associated with Islam, which are Quran, Hijab, um, Allah, all, all those terms, basically. And uh, I intentionally avoid terms which are related to, for example, extremism, because the whole idea is that we want to actually extract articles generally which deal with Islam. So this is a very high level view of uh, the, the structure. And then we use machine learning classifier to classify articles on the basis of conflict and non-conflict. Now, most of the people here are, uh, I guess, not um, um, familiar with machine learning. Maybe they are, but I will just go through how, I, how, how the framework works, basically. So um, what we do is basically, so uh, machine learning, we, uh, we, are, we use different kinds of techniques. One is supervised machine lear uh, uh, learning model, where you actually provide a labeled sample of articles um, uh, to uh, um, you use that label sample of training data to produce an inferred function. So for example, you, uh, you have uh, articles which are classified as conflict and non-conflict. They are actually uh, fed into um, the machine learning algorithm, which sort of produces an, uh, a function that will allow us to map new examples um, so for uh, example, so that we can predict whether the article is about conflict or not conflict. Now, one problem with this approach is that we need to code the articles. So someone has to say, well, this is a conflict article and this is a non-conflict article. Because this tool is automated and we wanted it to be, uh, um, because it runs on a daily basis, we had to automate uh, certain parts of it. Um, so we actually, what we did was we actually uh, came up with a, a technique for um, defining the article as, as um, a conflict article on the basis of conflict terms. So WordNet is, uh, is uh, a tool through which you can actually extract semantic networks of uh, terms. So for example, if you extract the semantic network of term conflict, you will get terms like war, combat, force. So um, I extracted that set, basically. And for all, then what I, what I do is basically I go through all the articles. And if there is a presence of any conflict-related term, I classify it as conflict. And if there is absence of a, uh, the terms from the set, uh, then I classify it as non-conflict. So this is, in a nutshell, how it's actually uh, what's happening. Now, um, I'll go into, there, uh, there is actually, uh, I have a slide on the heuristics. I think I, wo I won't go into how I actually uh, the actual algorithm itself, but briefly touch upon it. The goal here is essentially that 
we max we optimize the uh, the uh, the classifier by actually iteratively increasing the number of contract terms until we get a high uh, level of accuracy on the existing data. So I think most of the uh, people I think will find it more uh, too uh, technical. So but I'll just show you here. So for example, we will actually increase the conflict terms um, until we hit the maximum cross-validation score for that given amount of data. And once that is done, then we serialize uh, the classifier. That will allow us to actually use this particular classifier to uh, make predictions on a new data. Now, because this is actually based on uh, automated data set, how do we know that this is actually uh, uh, classifying uh, conflict appropriately? So for that, what we did was we actually uh, developed a gold standard for it. So in other words, we manually annotated 103 articles. Um, there were five different users who actually coded these articles. Um, they looked at the articles and they classified it as conflict and non-conflict. And the first goal that we had was we wanted to uh, ascertain whether there was inter-user agreement between the users. Because it's possible that my definition of conflict is, could be different from Sam's definition of conflict. And we found that there was a very high degree of agreement in the user. So, our, so there's a statistic that is used to do that. So our KFS statistic measure uh, indicates uh, almost perfect, perfect agreement among the users. So that allows us to, uh, users are uh, were basically um, I used uh, it to create this particular set. So from different diverse backgrounds, um, they will just they would just look at the they were looking at the text and then classifying them uh, on the basis of conflict and non-conflict. Um, so once we have uh, the uh, truth labels for all the articles, what we did was we evaluated our classifier against those uh, truth labels. So we have, for example, human classification results, which will classify our article on the basis of conflict and non-conflict, and then we'll be matched it against uh, the machine classification that results that we had. And for this particular study, the, the, we found that we, have a, we had a very high degree of accuracy for, um, for our classifier, which was 99%. Uh, now, this is actually very high because uh, this is a custom classifier that we're building. Typically, when you have standard classifiers, uh, like, for example, you are building a classifier on a topic like health or, um, or sports, they are easy to actually um, construct. But when you're building custom, uh, custom classifiers, it is, um, you have to have uh, the degree of accuracy is quite low. But remarkably, this came up. The heuristic was able to come up with a uh, very high degree of accuracy. It's the users? Uh, that, well, there, there's, there's a, there, that is subject to interpretation because KPA statistic actually interprets it, the results in different in different in different manner. So, by and large, there was a high degree of agreement, which means, for example, like if he, there were 103 articles, let's say 98 of uh, the articles um, we had consensus on 98 of the articles. So, just to give you an, to give you an example. So, this particular um, uh, classifier. Uh, is used to actually create an index, which, index which is called Scythe Index, Huntington Index, which uh, uh, which measures the polarity uh, of uh, conflict in an article. So 100 means that you have maximum conflict, and zero means actually you have minimum conflict. Um, and, and there are different weights assigned to that particular index. So I mean, first of all, we're using the classifier to a priori determine whether the, do the document has conflict or not. So that has 50% weight. The second thing that I'm using is actually the conflict terms themselves. Because our conflict is typified by certain terms, we give more weight to those terms. So 30% of that actually comes from that. And then finally, because um, a lot of uh, studies have already indicated that nation states are actually at the root of conflict, um, we assume that the presence of terms which denote nation state may indicate the likelihood of conflict between uh, the, the nation states. So we uh, assign 20% weight to that. Now we can, of course, alter these uh, these weights, but largely this index is uh, driven um, by the uh, the classifier. Now I'll show you the uh, the actual page. This is the actual tool, and in the, in the tool, what you can see is that uh, uh, you can look uh, into you can uh, go through different media sources. What it's showing you is. Uh, for a given media source, the percentage of articles that were classified as conflict. So for example, Al Jazeera here, uh, 
the articles that deal with Islam, 93% of those articles were actually about conflict, which is quite remarkable because the aim of Al Jazeera was to introduce an Arab world reporting that is distant from propaganda. That was the whole aim. But they end up actually reporting 93% of the, uh, the articles on Islam on conflict, so which was quite uh, an in interesting fight. And then below that is Times of India, and uh, that was, again, an interesting insight. Um, the 37% of the articles uh, were classified as conflicts, uh, uh, which, is a, which is actually low, because we thought, because there is, a, uh, there is an ongoing situation between Pakistan and India, we expected the number to be higher. Um, so th that, that immediately pops up. Now, um, I'll just show you just, uh, this is this conflict scorecard that we uh, produced as part of the study, actually. So you will see that predominantly, majority of the global media sources, when they are reporting on Islam, they're reporting about conflict. So the, the tool actually confirms the hypothesis, basically, that we, are, we, are, we, are, we, we, have, uh, we were aiming to uh, deconstruct or, or establish. So I'm not going to go into the features of tool, but for example, you can, um, in, there are a number of different features, but you can look into conflict map for a particular uh, news uh, source. You can uh, also look into the actual articles, how they were classified, uh, et cetera. But another question that we had in mind was to understand what was the actual underlying discourse for a given media source. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, Times of India, when they were talking about Islam, what are different themes that are present in the discourse? So we uh, used a topic modeling to uh, sort of extract the topical frames or themes that are part of the discourse uh, uh, that constitute uh, Times of India articles. And how that essentially works is so in, in this, uh, uh, I, uh, we used uh, an algorithm called latent judicial allocation, which essentially intuitively works like this, like this that, that each uh, article can have multiple topics. So for example, if there is a, a sports article in which a sports player gets injured, you will have two different topics in there. One topic will deal with sports, which will have like, uh, terms like uh, scores, uh, ground, player, and then another set of uh, terms will deal with uh, the, the topic of health. So you will have injured, um, health, hospital. So you are able to sort of lump these uh, clusters and you're able to extract these topics. Now, we uh, ended up actually using uh, five topics for each media source. We extracted five different topics. Um, that is an arbitrary number. You can actually have more than five topics as well. But we thought that that is a, a number that users were more, more convenient with when they were actually looking at the data. So what you see here over there is a dashboard which will show you for all the given media sources uh, the topical frames um, uh, or different themes that are there. And right uh, next to it is actually uh, a square which sort of shows you how it is classified it as. So if it's green, it, it is, of course, a non-conflict frame. So what is uh, interesting here is that if you look at Al Jazeera, uh, most of its frames are actually conflict frames. And if you look at Times of India, you'll find only two of the frames are about conflict. Now we'll go deeper into what we can see the column headings well. Are they all the same in each row or are they different for each row? Uh, they're, diff uh, they're all co uh, conversations, basically. So the same column heading. So I'll go into the, I'll show you the next, uh, okay. you'll see. All right, so, uh, so, sure, sure, so. If you click on a conversation, so you can actually look at the cluster of terms. You, it, then there is an index that we have there which tells you how we have classified it as. It gives you topic strength, which means how strong the topic is. The size of the actual, uh, 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 the circle over there denotes the, uh, the weight of that particular term in that particular cluster. And we have coded them as, uh, color coded them as red and orange on the basis of conflict and nation state. So if, if there is a term, if, if, uh, if there's a term that is, uh, that is about conflict, we code it as red. And if the term is about nation state, we color, color it as orange. So that will allow you to quickly visualize what the frame is about. Uh, you can also, for example, click on a particular term and look at the actual concordance of that particular term, how it was mentioned. 
and how we classified that particular article as. So this is just how this particular conversation is actually structured. But I'm just going to go and show you uh, our uh, results on this one, uh, user results. So we showed these uh, particular uh, frames or conversations to the users, and the users agreed with uh, our classification uh, 24 out of 25, uh, in 24 out of 25 cases, which is a high number. And the other thing was that there were no conversations that the users found not coherent, because uh, this is a statistically generated tool. It's possible that you can have um, topics which do not make any sense. So, uh, so, so our results sort of confirm that the topic modeling here is um, giving us robust results. Now I'll just go sh show you how this actually will enable us to understand discourse that's, uh, re that underlies um, uh, the uh, particular media source. The so first uh, cluster that we have, I don't know whether you can see the terms or not, but uh, we have labeled it, labeled it as uh, domestic politics. The reason why we label it as domestic politics is because it has terms like minority, religion, Modi, government, Sikh, law. Pretty much it exhibits heterogeneity of voices um, that constitute um, uh, Indian democracy, it, which is the largest democracy in the world. So that is a, and we've classified it as um, non-conflict, as you can see from the green color code. And so this is the first cluster that you extract. So you, this is something that, uh, uh, that, that allows us to extract uh, frames and conversations which are not about conflict. So this is one example. If you look at the second one, this is the classical conflict frame that you'll find in a uh, majority of the uh, global media sources. And this, this particular one is, uh, deals with Syria and Middle East, and you can see the terms like military, terror, violence, ISIL, Syria. They are, these terms suggest that the conversation represents the conflict uh, that's happening in Syria. Again, this is our interpretation, but again, um, the whole purpose of this is to actually find coherent topics that are part of the underlying discourse. The third one we have is actually um, uh, also a conflict-based frame, but um, what is interesting is that the topic modeling was able to extract it as a separate conversation. So this actually deals with the conflict that is going on in Yemen. So this, this, actually, this, this uh, study took place in April. So, um, the Yemen conflict was a se separate conflict that was happening in the Middle East. So it treated it, even though it treated it as a conflict frame, uh, it tre treated it as a separate frame. So it was able to tease out uh, this particular topic uh, as a separate modular frame. The fourth one that we have deals with Muslim community, because if you look at the terms here, uh, we have terms like, for example, Muslim, Urdu, Islam, they typify Muslim community in, in India. And the index for that one is seven because uh, uh, this really doesn't deal with the militant conflict that uh, we were earlier talking about. So that's why it's classified as, uh, as a non-conflict uh, frame. Now finally we have, because this is, a, uh, this is all based on uh, statistical algorithms, you have some aberrations as well. So this is the fifth frame that we have. Even though the, uh, the, the, the frame is actually quite coherent, and it deals with civic uh, and the municipal politics in India because uh, you have terms like, for example, resident, house, local, district, mosque, temple, church. There is this, um, the, the presence of the term terror sort of is an aberration in the, uh, for this particular topic. But by and large, this is a coherent topic and we've classified it as a non-conflict uh, because of the, um, because the majority of the terms were, uh, were not about conflict. So, um, so, so using topic modeling, we were able to extract uh, frames of conversations which uh, uh, were not about conflict, and we also were able to sort of like identify the dominant frames which are part of uh, the global media sources um, in our tool implementation. So in a nutshell, basically, our text analysis tool, um, what it uncovers the ideology that is embedded in the text, so unlike other tools which just focus on uh, extracting patterns and data without focusing on the ideology. And the second thing is that um, it also bridges critical theory with media analysis. And critical theory has been criticized for um, elitist theorizing and lack of extended empirical studies. So this tool will allow empirical evidence on real-time basis um, 
uh, that we can use in newsrooms or in academia. And basically, it's providing you a practical hermeneutics for media narratives. So I think um, I want to thank um, the, some people here um, before I um, open the forum for questions. We have Ethan Zuckerman, who is my uh, PI, Catherine Hawassi, Edward Chapa, and of course, uh, Sandfish. And I guess um, I'll open the forum for uh, questions um, now. Yeah. Thank you. here and ask you one quick first question. It, it seems to me like your definition of conflict is really core to this entire project, yeah. right? Um, and I know that you put a lot of effort into, into trying to have that be a balanced definition of conflict. One thing you said earlier was that if there, are, is, there's, if there is ongoing conflict between two parties, you didn't consider that as part of your definition of conflict. And I wonder if you could just elucidate a little bit more how you're defining con conflict for this and maybe how it might need to change if you were focused on a different culture or a different topic? Uh, so, I mean, I think what I said was that if there's an ongoing conflict, let's say, for example, there is a, a minority which is actually is having conflict with the uh, majority in a particular nation state. Um, if that conflict is not marked by militancy, I do not treat it as a conflict because that is part of politics. The point is it becomes militant. Uh, the point it there is use of force there, then I will classify it as conflict. So I think, um, for me, the key linguistic marker, which will define what conflict is, has to do really to do with force and militancy. Uh, have I answered the questions? Uh, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Could you give a couple of examples, for example, Kashmir versus the Rwandan minority in Belgium? Sorry, in Burma? Uh, yeah, okay, so, yeah, so for example, uh, so, yeah, so, both of them would be marked as conflict, because there is militant conflict there. Uh, in Kashmir, you have an ongoing, an ongoing issue between India and Pakistan, and in Burma, you have the Rohingyas. And there, there's the conflict, the, which is uh, marked by force uh, between Buddhist monks and the Rohingya community. So that will be characterized as a conflict uh, situation for me. Um, I'm wondering, like. I'm just curious, like, how sensitive you think your results are to some of your parameters, like, for example, like, number of LDA topics. Do you think that if you sort of had searched for 20 LDA topics, maybe you would have found conflict frames that didn't sort of bubble up when you searched for five? Maybe there were conflicts there that were kind of, like, subtopics? Okay, so, so I mean, if you were using fewer topics, you will end up with predominantly dominant discourses. So if you have three topics, you will actually see just the dominant discourses that are there. So the idea here is like you increase it to uh, a number where you're able to extract uh, uh, topics which are not part of the dominant discourse. So what we did was uh, we wanted to go take it to the next, like take, take it to you know like uh, n number, like seven or eight different topics or nine topics. We, but we found that the, it was very difficult for users to actually navigate w uh, what's going on over there. But certainly we can actually I think if we actually increase the number of topics, uh, we will have, uh, I mean, you will see uh, a very different composition of topics. Um, will be quite different from what we have here. Um, so I think that will probably, I mean, you have to go through some sort of study to answer that question, I guess. Uh, yes. Um, I'm, oh. No, go. Okay. This might, maybe you want to address this as you move along, but I'm just wondering, as a practitioner, what I, um, you know, but I work with Global Voices, an international community of journalists and bloggers and writers who we think a lot about these issues and, and language used in mainstream media discourse, and I think this is the kind of thing that we're, we're always like, oh, those publications portray things this way, but of course we don't have data, we just like know that. Um, but so what, like, so what should, what might this, what does this suggest for these publications that you studied, alternative groups that are interested in, you know, using a different kind of language or what, like, what's the, if you were going to propose sort of some kind of changes or, or actions out of this, what, what would I mean, it, this tool could be used in a number of different ways. I mean, 
you can use in an academia to understand the discourse itself. When it comes to newsroom, you can look at what sort of coverage your, uh, your particular um, organization is actually focus, focusing on. So uh, um, one of the, like, the future things that I have on the list is actually to use uh, global voices to see if we're able to, uh, to see the difference between global media and the mainstream sources that are there, how the discourse is, how, how, how the coverage is actually different in, in the sources. So that will allow uh, organizations to see um, whether they're reporting on just the dominant discourses or do they, do they have other areas to focus on. So for example, Times of India is doing a great job. Al Jazeera is not. So Al Jazeera, which has an agenda to actually sort of like uh, come up with the uh, with the with the coverage of Islam, which is more neutral, it's actually involved in you know uh, in, in covering Islam in conflict terms. So I guess this tool could be used for, uh, by them to sort of understand their coverage. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. One draws on um, what was your name? Ellery. Ellery's uh, last question to um, and the other is separate. So so that one, are you? planning on using this tool to reach out to these organizations to connect them with your findings so that they see sort of where they fall on the scale and then might Al Jazeera then be encouraged to do something differently and then would you come up with specific recommendations on how they might uh, cover things not in such conflict terms or is that something you leave to someone else? Yeah, definitely not uh, going in that direction but uh, certainly, I was approached by uh, Global Voices, uh, Evan Segal. He was interested in actually understanding where, how um, the coverage in Global Voices is different from the mainstream media source. So that was the question that he had in mind. And um, uh, so I think a lot of the organization would, organization would be interested in looking at this, if this particular uh, discourse tool is available to them, to s sort of like uh, do an audit on you know, how they're covering a particular uh, issue was how duplicable is this? Um, so this is something that you've done with respect to conflict in your hypothesis on, on Huntington versus more nuanced um, terms of seeing the world. And is this, is, this the, is this the project or would you contemplate having other hypotheses and then would you need to also have other user focus groups to calibrate with the machine learning? Yes. So the uh, so one of the questions that um, uh, we had about this tool was, can we generalize this for any given hypothesis? So, and again, it's a, it's a it's a quite a challenging problem because you can see that this is a very nuanced sort of uh, uh, analysis that is produced. So we we when we are building this tool, we have to take into account what we what we are looking at. Um, so as a next iteration, we are going to do. Uh, we are going to look at African American community and link it to either crime or inequality in in, uh, in American media, basically, and see how this tool actually is able to extract the discourse there. And the next step would be basically to find some generalized uh, parameters that we can use to build a tool that uh, could be uh, used for answering any kind of hypothesis. Uh, there was a question there. Um, I mean, this is fascinating work, and it's the sort of thing you here and it's like yeah obviously you do all these things together and you know in retrospect it seems almost common sense but um, I've got two very different questions one is sort of methodologically unless I miss something you're not actually using machine learning you've got you know you've built your classifier based on human learning of you know various terms etc and just sort of hooked up your handcrafted classifier to, you know, the, the class, you know, the sort of bulk data processing of a machine learning thing, but you're not, you're not, you're not actually using, the machine is not actually learning from, you're not training it with data, you're providing it with the algorithm. That's sort of the first question. The second question, which is very different, is, you know, this seems so obvious in retrospect. Is there anybody else doing this sort of stuff? You know, marketers, you think, or, you know, Google or, or whatever? Uh, okay, so I'll, um, so I'll answer the first question. Um, so I think, I mean, I mean, essentially, I am using machine learning here because uh, the first part where we are actually extracting the, I'll just show you, um, 
OK, so we are extracting the articles from Media Cloud using the query that we have. And then we are actually uh, classifying the articles on the basis of conflict and non-conflict from the terms that we are getting from uh, the semantic network. So that is the training sample that we have. And then we do what we do is that we actually build, we do cross-validation on the existing data that we have. So the classifier is, is actually generating the training sample itself. And the reason why we want to do that is because language is evolving um, in real time for us. And to ensure that our particular classifier is actually corresponds with uh, our definition of conflict and others, we have this, uh, as I mentioned, the gold standard that we have created, which is human coded uh, articles that we also use to check whether the classifier is actually uh, giving a high accuracy on uh, these particular articles. So that the, the heuristic is, I mean, I think you can, um, I didn't go uh, you know, um, in, in depth in about the heuristic essentially, but it, I mean, it's, 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 it looks at a variety of different uh, classifying algorithms. It looks at different features, so I look at different kinds of grammars. I look at different vectorizers, and, uh, and I optimize the classifier based on the cross-validation score. And then once it's serialized, then it's used to actually use uh, to predict all the articles that, that are part of the uh, extract, transform, load process for a given day. And the, the other part that you have is the, the, the human coded uh, uh, articles will provide, you know, sort of like an objective picture of whether the classifier is working appropriately or not. The second thing is uh, the, the question was regarding the marketing and stuff. Uh, yes, the, I mean, Unilever sort of was interested in actually using it for marketing and insights, this particular tool. Uh, so it, it can have uh, different kinds of applications because they can ask different kind of questions uh, and you know, look at that. Um, but really what we have, to do is, we, have to, we have to do is change the pipeline for that. But for our purpose, we were really trying to actually link the ideology with the text in our, in our implementation. Uh, this question is, uh, um, sure, OK. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, technical question, are you running this on a NoSQL database? Would that be your ultimate platform? Second, and maybe related to yours, I come from the commercial side, and I'm interested in rhetorical strategies, influence strategies, and I have an ontology that, that is intriguing how it could be you know, made into this. Is there room, as you study discourse, to try to tease out from your data the, the strategies, the rhetorical strategies that are involved in or behind the discourse? In other words, they're having an exchange, they're having a conflict, they're having an agreement. But what are the underlying strategies that the parties are using to essentially navigate their point of view? Is there, is there room in your system to, 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 to find that or tease it out or incorporate it? Uh, y yes. Uh, the first question is no SQL uh, database. I, I think um, I'm not using no SQL uh, database, I mean, like MongoDB or something like that, but it is, I mean, it really extracting the JSON uh, based. Uh, it's JSON based, so actually I can scale it using the any kind of NoSQL uh, database, so th that's th that's not not a problem. I mean, that's an architecture uh, issue. But this was because this was developed as part of the thesis. I didn't take into account that I have to scale it um, in terms of uh, an architectural system. The second question that you had was, I mean, this I showed you some aspects of the tool, but the tool is quite nuanced. You can go and um, look into concordance. You could look in, look in, into other aspects as well. And because corpus linguistics uh, is itself is a very broad field you can actually incorporate a lot of the techniques that are used in corpus linguistics, co-location and other stuff to answer the question regarding what sort of rhetoric or you know, techniques are used um, by different communities or different, in different discourses um, uh, in a given media source or given pipeline that you're using uh, to understand what the discourse is. So that's certainly doable. Uh, there is a question here. Yes, I was wondering if the difference that you saw between the Times of India and Al Jazeera reflects, you know, the fact that the Times of India's coverage is mostly of things inside India, and except except at the edge around Kashmir, relations between you know Muslims and everybody else in India are mostly not conflictual, whereas Al Jazeera is focusing on an area that has a heavy amount of conflict. 
Uh, right. So, I, okay. So, why Times of India is remarkable is because um, we are extracting articles on the basis of whether they uh, are about Islam or not, right? And uh, if you look at the mainstream media sources in, in India and Pakistan, you will find that religious discourse in the countries essentially focuses on issues of conflict most of the time. And um, what was remarkable about, remarkable about Times of India was that it is actually lower than some of the media sources that we have uh, in Pakistan. So, uh, which means that they are looking at other aspects of Muslim life as well. Right, so, I have to use that too because India is a country where most of is mostly the Islamic population is not in conflict with anybody else. Uh, uh, yes, that's that's true. So, but they are doing they're focusing on other areas as well. So, uh, I think if you uh, sort of like you want to use the same model for Al Jazeera, they can actually focus on other aspects as well, not just the conflict part. So th that that was, uh, I think, the difference basically between the two. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, just something tied into that. Did you have a threshold requirement before you consider a newspaper? Like, did you, for example, say, we're going to look at newspapers which had, say, 100 articles a year on Islam, like generally, you know? Or did you only take those into account? Because otherwise, there might be a problem that the coverage would revolve I don't say sensational events that surround Islam, but the large portion of the coverage would be on you know mundane day-to-day non-Islamic things like say in India for the Times of India. So did, was there a threshold requirement for considering newspaper? Uh, no, there was no threshold requirement. Um, um, so I didn't take into account that. Um, okay. Yeah, Sam, you do that. So it's kind of piggybacking off of Keith's question, but a little more general, and it's not very practical, but since you're suggesting it for academia, perhaps you got a chance to look at it. In general, if you look at the media, uh, you know, the media publishes more articles about fires and murders and conflictual things in general. Do you define the percentage, it, 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 or have you even thought about looking if the percentages are any different? Um... I didn't get the question. Other than conflict, is that your question? So, um, if you look at, at a regular, you know, the whole media that published anywhere, mm -hmm. and you look at percentages of con conflictual publications versus non-conflictual, okay, uh -huh. is there any is a delta between those any difference in the delta in your foundation? So I didn't actually do a study on that, but uh, between the sample, the 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 publication that we had, we found. Some, for example, Times of India, Dawn, and News, as different from um, other sources because they were not primarily focused on conflict. So that was uh, we didn't uh, like really like focus on like whether what's the difference or delta over there. But uh, that could be an interesting question um, to look into. Um. Um, okay, so I had a question about the methodology. So you had two classifiers. Right, one based on WordNet, which is a keyword classifier. It's not a classifier. It's just um, uh, it's a set of terms uh, which is just basically sh uh, which are related to conflict. So that is just a linguistic marker for us to uh, say that okay, if a particular article contains any of those terms, we will cl we will use that as a training sample for conflict articles. Okay, so then you still have to find those articles as conflict articles. Right, uh, based on the keywords. Right. So, but you, what, what basically I'm doing is I'm, let's say, if I'm actually holding the data on 60 percent, testing it on 40 percent, and then once the classifier is actually built, the whole cl classifier is built, serialized, then I use the the human coded uh, uh, sample to see if the classifier performs equally well over there, because it's easier to actually come up with a, you know, like a really high level of accuracy on the ex the data that it's trained on, actually. Right. So that I do, but. The other part helps us where we look at the independent data set. So, um, what I'm getting at is, if if you are deciding what is a conflict article and what is not a conflict article based on keywords, why do you then go and build a machine learning algorithm to then like classify it, further? Uh, you, you cannot because if you if you for example, what that allows you is if you look at the heuristic that I have is that. Um, the, if you have, let's say, one uh, conflict term in, in a pr given article, and you start actually using, you build a classifier based on that, you will get really poor results. 
So you want a classifier which is robust. So what I am doing here is I increase the conflict terms one by one, iteratively, um, and then see what the classification score is. So there, so there are articles which do not have any conflict, and there are articles which have X number of conflict terms. So the goal is when we reach the maximum score for on cross relation score, we stop there because we retain the, mag the a large feature space which will allow us to actually uh, classify our, uh, articles which are uh, new or not part of the main space. So that is the uh, way the heuristic function. So, if, for example, what I, the slide you, that you see over here, uh, what I'm doing is because majority of the articles are about conflict, I actually use pre 2001 corpus to extract articles which are not about conflict. So that helps as well. And then you have the, 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 the articles which, are, which we're getting on a daily basis, which are, are used to create a training set which will give us the ideal classifier. Because if you just use it on just conflict, uh, on you know, you classify the, the article based on a conflict, you won't get any, uh, any robust results. Yes, yes. Um, well, I just want to say, I, I really, I always have loved it, and I still love the idea of bridging critical theory, like making critical theory empirically testable. Like, I feel like that is one of the really, like the overarching concepts that's the most strong about this, and that like you could take that in many different directions and start to iterate on that idea in a lot of interesting ways. So I think that's really compelling, and I'd be really curious to see, like to hear from humanities people uh, uh, or critical theorists themselves about like the, the kind of response to that, and I, I'd, so I'd kind of be curious if you've gotten any responses from them and whether they are resistant or not to the idea of making it empirical. Um, but then the other thing I was going to say, which I think relates back to Ellery's question or, or comment, actually was around the, the sort of practical application and, and potentially like the theory of change here. And I thought about this in relationship to the Center for Civic Media Tools more generally as well. It was like if there are a way, I know it's like at this point this was like a, it was a thesis project, so you're saying you had not you know, built it in a more generalized way of scale or whatever, but if there were a way to do that, and then I think for also some of the civic media's other tools, like I'm thinking of the geography classification stuff that we worked on and things that other people are working on, like I could see the application if we get those tools to a more generalized standpoint to where they can be used at that point of editorial decisions. So if you have, say, real-time insight as the editor of Al Jazeera into like, oh, okay, look at what our coverage of Muslims has looked like so far. Like it's, we're basically have been talking about Islam in um, terms of war and conflict. Can we modulate that? Like, can we adjust that in some way? You know, so if you had those analytics and you had them in this kind of real time way, then when you're deciding whether to or not to run a story or whether you're, you're like making these like large scale investments in like longer form stories and things like that, you might potentially make different editorial decisions. So I mean, I feel like that, if we could ever, if we could scale the tools to where that they're easy enough to use, that they could be used in a news organization, I feel like that could be a really <coughs> powerful way to like, put the feedback mechanism into the media itself. Yes, I think that is one of the things that I have as part of uh, the future um, uh, work that I'm going to work on the, oh, as part of this tool, actually, um, at the Center for Civic Media. Yeah. I mean, I think I know there's like a lot of technical things that make that difficult, and it would also be difficult from the news side. Like they'd have to have access to their whole corpus to plug into it and everything. But, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, because we have Media Cloud available, there's a lot of um, we can leverage in Media Cloud to build a, a lot of these tools, which um, will enable enable us to actually flesh out this. Critical theorists, uh, uh, just one uh, friend of mine, he's an anthropologist, and he found it uh, quite interesting because he thought it could be used to um, look into uh, discourse surrounding different communities. For example, how Christians are covered in Indonesia. So um, that's that's what he like. I, I, but no one actually gave me a formal sort of like feedback. That's a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you had done any stratified studies to look for the influence of possible confounding in uh, uh, biasing some of the conclusions. For example, Al Jazeera might have more coverage of Syria and Iraq. Have you compared the coverage of Syria and Iraq in times of India versus Al Jazeera 
to see if you get the same level sort of, my of difference too. in the use of conflict terms, or are you pa partially uh, seeing the effect that Times of India may have more cultural orientation and looking at other things, whereas Al Jazeera may be hard news and more focused on the Middle Sorry, East, where there's a higher level of conflict. For example, in Pakistan, there may be a lot of coverage of internal conflicts and internal terrorism that doesn't exist in India, which might also bias things somewhat to a higher level of conflict terms. So I didn't look, in, I didn't look into that, what you were suggesting, like uh, comparing uh, the coverage of a particular, let's say, Syrian, Syrian conflict in times of India and Al Jazeera. But um, having said that, I think if you look at uh, if you look at the Middle Eastern uh, geography, it's quite diverse. And if you look at how Al Jazeera is approaching the problem, is it's actually uh, treating it in 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 the context of okay, this is the larger Islamic world, and that is the same paradigm that Huntington has. Like, feed this as a, an overarching sort of like a, a map for a uh, lot of different communities, because I think that uh, Pakistani uh, community is very different from Indonesian community. And just to lump them under one appellation of religion, basically, what, it, that, what that does is that creates those uh, sort of like uh, stereotypes that, uh, that I've talked about in my discussion. And I think, um, so with Al Jazeera, I think um, they can probably focus on other aspects if they treat uh, these nation states and communities in a disparate manner. But I, I don't think that they're doing it. Again, I mean, this is my assumption that, you know, that I have based on the coverage that I've seen in Al Jazeera. So Al Jazeera doesn't use terms like Shiites versus Sufis versus Sunnis versus others? They, they use these terms, but um, when they are talking about, for example, they will look at a, at a conflict issue uh, happening, let's say, in Syria or Yemen or any other area. But they don't focus on other aspects of these communities, um, the region. For example, if you look at uh, whether they're covering, they're, it's a Qatar-based media, and they don't have enough. Like uh, uh, they don't. If you look at the coverage, their coverage of a Qatar, it's not even. It's not that diverse as well, because you would expect them to actually uh, focus on some of the other areas um, that deal with their day-to-day -day -day life. So that's not there as well. So again, I mean, there are a lot of things that. Uh, we can look into because there are so many aspects to it. It's hard to actually, um, this was my sort of like first attempt to uh, look into the discourse question. So each of these uh, dimensions actually posits, you know, uh, a different way of looking at things and, you know, a study to look into what are the findings from there. So which is, I think, which was sort of like uh, uh, beyond the scope at, when I was actually working on uh, the project. Uh, so I'm just curious I kind of to you know, follow up on some of these other questions over here. Some of the, like the difference between uh, Times of India and uh, Al Jazeera can be sort of explained by uh, Al Jazeera sort of looking to uh, have shows pitch stories to an international audience and uh, Times of India going to a domestic audience and international audience is just sort of being interested in kind of state level or larger scale things rather than a domestic audience where there are more into kind of day to day, that, that, yeah, you can explain um, um, that through uh, that um, paradigm. But my question is that if you're actually doing that, you are sort of like you're doing the same thing by actually looking at this aspect in a homogenized manner, and you shouldn't be doing that. You should. Uh, I mean, that's again, you know, my my understanding is that if you do it, then you are actually creating um, these stereotypes. Uh, which sort uh, which are about like civil civilizational conflict or you know which sort of fit one group with the other you know at a higher level, that's the reason why I'm I'm saying that they have to come up with other ways of reporting to report on other aspects of Muslim life. Any more questions? Well, I'm curious if you could take it a little bit deeper on the question of associating Islam with conflict. I mean, there are a lot of different, like I look at, you know, the words and circles and I'm like, but what about all the other words? You know, <laughs> like there's a lot, there's so much nuance that might be brought to a story that is about, that does 
link these things and another story that might include a lot of the same words could be sort of hopelessly, you know, ignorant and incorrect. So I'm curious if, if there might, I mean, I know that that's not quite the area that this study was mm -hmm. intending to, to suss out, but I wonder if that would be in a next iteration, if there could be sort of a new set, a, like a new linguistic analysis you could layer on top of it to try to dig deeper on, on that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I think one idea that uh, I should mention here is that the Foucauldian idea of the discourse, which is that it is produced, actually. It, it produces certain kind of uh, representation. And that, that's where the whole thing comes in, where you, you're sort of like producing these, this, uh, these objects which deal with just the, the conflict. Essentially, so that that is, I think, what drives the whole thing. So I, I think we can look into that linguistic analysis, yes. But I think for this particular in in, in this particular implementation, I was looking at the idea of discourse. When you, when you use the word objects, uh, so object. in the sense, are you talking about individual linguistic markers, or are you talking about like a more complex object or a co-occurrence of words? Or something like that? So when Foucault talks about uh, objects, basically in discourse. A, he talks about announcements or statements. It could be anything. So it could be anything that is part of a discipline, a practice, um, something that comes up in media, something that is part of you know a medical practice. That all these statements are part of the discursive formation, which are a result of the uh, power relations. Basically, that's how actually he defines it. Thank Ali then. Thank you very Thanks. much.